Good evening and welcome to our first of the Holy Week services on uh, tonight, Maundy Thursday. It's wonderful to have you all here. Uh, as far as announcements go, uh, just remember all the services we have available this week. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, two services, uh, one at noon and one at 6.30 for Good Friday. Two different sermons, uh, so you can come to both and hear different things. Um, for the, and then uh, Saturday Easter Vigil at 6.30 p.m. And, of course, Easter morning, uh, breakfast at 9 a.m., service at 10.15, and Easter egg hunt afterwards. So uh, be sure to join us for all of those. As far as the service tonight goes, just a couple things to note. Uh, one is that the service will begin uh, with, without an opening hand, it'll begin with the service of corporate confession absolution. And what corporate confession absolution is, is basically an extended version of what we do on Sunday morning. Um, and that is uh, at this time of Lent when we've been specifically repenting of our sins and, and coming to God in sorrow uh, for forgiveness of, for our sins. We get this extra assurance of Christ's forgiveness uh, by the laying on of uh, the hands um, of the pastor acting in the stead of Christ to forgive your sins. So uh, we'll go through the right just like it's in the bulletin. And then um, when it says, when the bulletin says uh, for you to come forward individually to the altar, um, we'll do it just kind of like we did Ash Wednesday uh, where you all line up and um, uh, come forward and receive the absolution and, and uh, head back to your head back to your seats. Also at the uh, end of the service, uh, there is no benediction at the end of the service. It ends with the stripping of the altar and the chanting of Psalm 22. And that is because really we consider uh, this service along with the two tomorrow and Easter vigil all one big service. Uh, it's called the Trivium in, uh, in Latin, which is uh, for three. Uh, three days in a row, all one, one long service. So tomorrow we won't have any invocations or benedictions uh, like tonight we don't have a benediction. Um, and then we'll finally get our benediction on, on Saturday night when Easter has arrived. So uh, that's all I have for the service tonight. Uh, we're going to be considering the gospel reading from John 13 when he washes the disciples' feet at the time of the Last Supper. Uh, so be on the lookout for that and the readings tonight and God's blessings on your worship. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I will go to the altar of God. Our help is in the name of the Lord. You may be seated. During this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's calling to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that prevents us from trusting in God and loving each other. Since it is our intention to receive the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ on this night when he instituted this blessed meal for our salvation, it is proper that we complete our Lenten discipline by diligently examining ourselves as St. Paul urges us to do. This holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort of those who fear, of those who are troubled because of their sin, and who humbly confess their sins, fear God's wrath, and hunger and thirst for righteousness. But when we examine our hearts and consciences, we find nothing in us but sin and death, from which we are incapable of delivering ourselves. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us. For our benefit he became man, so that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God, and to deliver us took upon himself our sin and punishment we deserve, so that we may more confidently believe this and be strengthened in the faith and in holy living. Our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take me, this is my body, which is given for you. It is as if he said, I became man, and all that I do and suffer is for your good. As a pledge of this, I give you my body to eat. In the same way also he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Again, it is as if he said, I have had mercy on you by taking it in myself, 
all your iniquities. I give myself into death, shedding my blood to obtain grace and forgiveness of sins, and to comfort and establish the New Testament, which gives forgiveness and everlasting salvation. As a pledge of this, I give you my blood to drink. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, confidently believing this word and promise of Christ, dwells in Christ, and Christ in him, and has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, showing his death, that he was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Giving him our most merciful, our most heartfelt thanks, we take up our cross and follow him, and according to his commandment, love one another as he has loved us. As our Lord on the night, on this night, exemplified his love by washing his disciples' feet. So we, by our words and actions, serve one another in love. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are all partakers of this one bread and drink from the one cup. For just as the one cup is filled with the wine of many grapes and the one bread from countless grains, so also we, being many, are one body in Christ. Because of him we love one another, not only in word, but in deed and in truth. May the Almighty and merciful God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit, accomplish this for us. Having heard the word of God, let us confess our sins, imploring God, our Father, for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Please rise. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings of death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith, do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the name of the Father, who is the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in peace. shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, that he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lands at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. 
They shall eat of the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 116 responsibly. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will the cup of salvation. Call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Praise the sight of the Lord. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will call to you the sacrifice I have and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. The Lord, 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 the The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why so many of you, that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world from the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water from, into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. This is the gospel of the Lord.
always follow through is as important as the task itself. What good would this sermon be if I wrote it and saved it on my computer, but never printed it out and preached it? Do you think the IRS would be okay with you if you filled out your tax return, but never actually sent it in? And of course, every Little League player knows that if you don't develop a good follow-through swing, then you'll never hit a home run. And that's why it's interesting, I think, that John begins his upper room discourse of Jesus. His upper room discourse of Jesus, which lasts for five chapters in John. John 13 through 17, it all takes place during the Last Supper, during the Lord's Supper. John doesn't interestingly record the words of institution like the other three Gospels do. Although he does come close in John 6 when he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. But nonetheless, John spends five chapters talking about what happens during the Lord's Supper and the words that Jesus preaches to his disciples during that time. But he begins it in this way. At the beginning of our reading tonight from John chapter 13, the beginning of the Upper Room Discourse. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. Jesus' passion, Jesus' love, they have followed him. He loves his people who are in the world to the very bitter end. Before we can discuss what that follow-through of Jesus' love looks like, I think it is first important to discuss what it even means that he would love us. The word may be familiar to you here. This is one of the famous passages where it is, where it is discussed, agape, agape love, that is, God love. Sometimes we just talk about it in theology that way, God love. Because in the Bible, whenever agape love is talked about, it is primarily talking about the way that God loves his people. It is a self-sacrificial love, a charity love, a love that puts the needs of others before your own needs. No regards for your own needs, really. When C.S. Lewis, who wrote the book, The Four Loves, and described all four biblical loves that he Identify. When he talked about agape love, he said this. The other three loves, affection and romantic and friendship, those other three loves, they're really just training grounds for this kind of love, for this kind of God love that is so self-sacrificial. When you think about it being self-sacrificial, you can think about how it is really then rooted in humility. I think of Paul's words in Romans 5, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. By our sinful corruption, we are simply too proud for agape love. You can think of how some people might be willing, some brave men might be willing to do and to die for what they think is a righteous cause. You can think of brave military men who have fought in what they see as just wars, fighting for a good cause, or how people will serve as police and firefighters, putting themselves in the line of danger before someone else. But those are exceptions to the general human sinful condition. Most of the time, you're too proud. Most of the time, you want to put yourself first. You want to look out for number one. You want to make sure that you have everything that you need, that you have food on your table. You want to make sure that you are comfortable, that you don't have any suffering in your life. If we think about it, we really are too proud, too prideful to have this agape love purely in us. And that's why what Jesus does here in John 13, is so shocking. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the very Creator God, 
He gets on his knees during the Last Supper. And the teacher watches his, washes his students' feet. In the ancient world, this was a common practice, but it was only at fancy meals. It was only at meals of the rich that feet would be washed, and it was the job of the slave. And so in our Lord, the Lord of all creation, takes the time, and takes the energy, and takes everything that he has, and gets on his knees for this luxury. It's not even necessary. They could have had the supper without the washing of the feet, but for this luxury for his disciples, and becomes humble, humble like a slave, Peter is confused at this. It is shocking. Lord, do you wash my feet? What I'm doing now, you do not understand. But afterward, you will understand. It is after the cross that they will understand. For the foot washing, the agape love of the foot washing, it is a foreshadowing of the agape love that he will show on the cross. First he humbles himself like a servant, but then he will humble himself even to the point of death, even death on the cross. You think the foot washing is agape love, just wait. It will be a hundredfold, but we will see tomorrow on Good Friday on the cross. That last quote in the part of Romans 5 that I quoted, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, but perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. The last part of this is that this, but God showed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think of that kind of love. Think of that kind of self-sacrificing love, that the righteous would die for the unrighteous, that the perfect would take on the punishment of the corrupt, that the king should die or should be slaves. Self-sacrifice like no other. Agape unknown to our corrupt flesh. And that brings us to the follow -up. For when Jesus says, when John says that Jesus loved them to the end, I don't think he's just talking about the foot washing, but he's also talking about this cross, about the cross itself. For when, in John's gospel, when Jesus dies, he says these words, it is finished. In the Greek, and sorry for all the Greek tonight, but it's very interesting. In the Greek, to telestai. From the Greek word telos, which means end. And that's exactly what John had said here in John 13. When he loved his own, he agape them to the telos. And then at the cross, it is telos, to telestai. It is ended. It is finished. To say it another way, the end of Christ's love is his sacrifice on the cross. He loved them, and he loves you now. He has loved the whole world by giving himself up for it, by taking on your punishment onto himself, by taking your pride and becoming humble. He doesn't cut out at the last moment, despite the cries from the crowd to save himself. He doesn't become proud and get down from the cross, even though he could. But he loves you to the very bitter end. He has followed through. And not only followed through with the cross, but followed through with the grave too. The crucifixion leads to the follow through of the resurrection. Not only does he defeat sin on the cross, and not only does he go to hell and defeat the devil in hell, but he rises again the third day to defeat death itself, so that you may have eternal life in him. Follow through upon follow through upon follow through. Loving you not just to the end of forgiving your sin, but loving you to the end that you might be in heaven with him one day. Christ is a man of follow through. And let's get back to the context when John says this, that he loved them to the end. Notice his concern, Jesus' concern, is leaving the disciples, leaving those who are in the world. He says his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. And so he loves them to the end. And one of the ways that he loves them to the end, one of the ways that he loves us to the end, is by not leaving us physically. For he did ascend in himself 
in his human nature and his divine nature to the Father in heaven. But from there, from there on his throne, he still gives us today, following through, following through with his promises, following through with his death and resurrection, giving us today his body and his blood. That's why we're here tonight. Jesus says this is his body broken for you. The same body broken on that tetelestai cross. This is his blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. The righteous loving the unrighteous, agape, self-sacrifice. And Paul reminds you that as often as you take this, as often as you receive this body and blood in yourself, you are proclaiming that cross, proclaiming that ongoing, finished cross and resurrection until he comes again, loving you to the end, following through, following through, following through. That's why it's his real body and real blood, by the way, at least one of the reasons, not just because he says so, but also this, it is such a real follow-through. It can't just be a symbol. It's real love because it's real self-sacrifice. He's really giving himself over to you. That's why Paul takes it so seriously. Don't eat this or drink this in an unworthy manner or else you're profaning the body and blood of Jesus because that's what it really is, the body and blood of Jesus. That's why it's also part of my job here to protect this altar, protecting people from themselves who don't know what the sacrament is, who don't know what they're taking, but also to ensuring that we would have here at this altar because of the real body and blood that Jesus gives us, what I would call agape fellowship with one another. True love, God love, fellowship with one another. For when Jesus concludes with his foot washing in John 13, he says this, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. When Christ loves you to the end, that leads you to love one another also. To strive for true fellowship and unity with one another. To give of yourself to help each other, to bear one another's burdens. And we do that tonight. We do that tonight as we come and we partake of the one cup and the one body. We come to this one altar together. There are many members, but we share in one cup. There are many parts, but we are one body together. The bread that came from many grains scattered over the hills has become one loaf. And so let us be gathered here tonight, from the ends of the earth, to Christ's kingdom together. Come together now, dear saints. Come to this altar and receive the agape love of Jesus Christ, who loved you perfectly to the end, fully to the end, completely to the end, following through always, and we, may we always share that followed through love with one another. To Christ our Passover Lamb be all the honor and glory and power now and forever. Amen. We rise for prayer. O oh Lord our God, we acknowledge your great goodness toward us and praise you for the mercy and grace that our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have known. We sincerely repent of the sins of this day and those in the past. Pardon our offenses, correct and reform what is lacking in us, and help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Inscribe your law on our hearts and equip us to serve you with holy and blameless lives. May each day remind us of the coming of night when no one can work. In the emptiness of this present age, keep us united by a living faith through the power of your Holy Spirit, with him who is the resurrection and the life that we may escape the bitter, eternal bitter pains of condemnation. By your Holy Spirit, bless the preaching of your word and the administration of your sacraments. Preserve these gifts to us and all Christians. Guard and protect us from all dangers to body and soul. Grant that we may with faithful perseverance receive from you our sorrows as well as our joys, knowing that health and sickness, riches and poverty, and all things come by the mission of your fatherly hand. Keep us this day under your protective care and preserve us securely trusting in your everlasting goodness and love, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns in the healing of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my crony? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. Through you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All you who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast. From my birth and from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and pouring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joy. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my grass. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of that. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me, that pierce my hands and feet. I can count all my bones, they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. Oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have refreshed me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you, you who fear the Lord, praise him, all you offspring of Jacob, glorify him, and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the, na the nations. All the prosperous 
of the earth, he can worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he 